Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Well, today on the show, we're discussing firearms. And in particular, we're talking about a world of firearms that I didn't know much about, and that's competition shooting. My guest today, his name is Mike Seeklander. He's based here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's actually helped me with content about firearms on the site. And he's a, a champion competitive shooter. Uh, he's actually one of the first contestants on History's Channel's uh, Top Shot, if you've seen that show. So today, Mike and I discuss about three-gun competition shooting, how you get started, what's involved. So if you're looking for a new hobby, a new sport, and you like guns, you'll get a lot out of this podcast. And besides being a competitive shooter, Mike is also a firearms and self-defense instructor. So he travels the country teaching not only uh, citizens, but also law enforcement agencies how to be better tacticians with weapons and not with weapons. So Mike and I also get into a little bit about self-defense. All right, so really interesting podcast. I think you'll like it. So without further ado, Mike Seeklander. All right, Mike Seeklander, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. All right, Mike. Uh, so you are a f- world-class firearms instructor as well as competitor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you end up doing what you're doing? Man, it's um, the the background is pretty diverse. I from childhood loved to shoot, loved guns, and um, you know, actually, I joined the Marine Corps in 1990. And sometime in that time frame, I ran across some videos of these guys shooting, do what we call practical shooting, running and gunning. And, and, you know, I shot a handgun as a young child. I hunted. I did all these different things. But when I saw what these guys could do, their ability to shoot, you know, and the speeds they could accomplish with the handguns, I was like, man, I'm in love with this. I got to try this. So throughout my Marine Corps career at the tail end and then later on in law enforcement at the same time, while I've always been doing you know, tactical or defensive stuff. I've been competing, you know, as a, as a shooter and now I'm a sponsored professional shooter. So it's uh it's been, it's been an interesting road. Uh, and you, uh, you were air marshal, right? Is that what you did in law yeah, enforcement? Man, it was, you know, it's funny, your listeners won't, won't think I can hold down a job. So basically I went from the Marine Corps and then moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where I was a, a police officer there for years and then 9-11 happened, and because of my shooting background and some of my connections, I had to uh, connect with the instructors in the Federal Air Marshal Academy. And, uh, man, I made a, made a phone call, and they said, wow, you know so-and-so, and you can do that. And I'm like, yeah. And they said, come on, come on up for an interview. So I did, and uh, the next thing I know, I am the lead firearms instructor for the Federal Air Marshal, what we used to call Phase 2 training program, which was – you know, after 9-11, they hired all these FAMs, and then we had to train them. So I was in charge of the initial firearms program. Of course, there were, you know, a lot of instructors that worked with me and, and, and for me and uh, contractors and special forces guys, and it was really a great place to learn a lot. Awesome. So uh, you you mentioned, okay, there's a difference between, like, you said there's practical shooting and there's competition shooting. You're a sponsored competitive, competitive shooter. Can you talk a little bit about competitive shooting? Because I think that's a world that a lot of people – aren't familiar with. Um, what are the events in competitive shooting? I think I said there's one that's called three gun, right? Is right. That- yeah. Yeah. So when we're ta- when we talk about practical shooting, the original sport called IPSC, which is the International Practical Shooting Confederation, was started years and years ago. And basically it was a, a, a gun handling and skills test made up by these old gunfighters, guys that carried 1911s and wanted to find a way to test their skills. And that evolved into the U.S. version of the sport, which is the United States Practical Shooting Association, and later on IDPA, which is called the International Defensive Pistol Association. And the bottom line is it's um, it's almost all done from the holster. Different sports require concealment. But if you can imagine running and gunning where, you know, speed and accuracy is always balanced. So, for example, you know, a lot of competitive sports, you know, you shoot a bullseye very slow with a rifle or a handgun or a bow and arrow. With practical shooting, you know, we're constantly shooting on the move. I mean, like I said, it was a combative-oriented sport. Now, of course, these days, you know, they're really fancy handguns in certain divisions. It's not, um, it's not really practical in any aspect unless you shoot IDPA, but it's running and gunning. And you mentioned three-gun. Of course, there's a sport of three-gun, which is instead of just competing with handguns, you're, sh- you're shooting the rifles, handguns, and shotguns, and oftentimes you're shooting all three guns on one stage in a match. Wow. So you are you like so when you say running and gunning? So you are on the move. Are you getting behind obstacles or barriers and then shooting 
from those positions? All of the above, man. Okay. If you can imagine, you know, we don't necessarily, I wouldn't say on, we're on obstacles like an obstacle course, but similar. I mean, there are walls, there are doors, there are positions we can shoot while we're moving. We're literally shooting targets and then running to the next targets and shooting, you know, the next array of targets. And originally what happened was they said, we're going to set up an array of, of threat targets and then you're going to have to run around and use cover and do all these different things. Well, that evolved into a more athletic sport, which is really, when I describe it as running and gunning, you know, if you get on my YouTube page or whatever page out there and, you know, look up IDPA or USPSA or my name, you'll find videos of us running and gunning. And that's literally, I mean, it's an athletic event, but skill with a handgun, rifle, or shotgun is also really, really important to do well in these sports. And they're they're incredibly fun. They're not slow and you know, some of the sports out there, I, to me, are maybe a little bit more boring. I mean, I enjoy them, but they're just not as fun. This is a, there. It's a fun sport, man. Yeah. Does the does the does that carry over to like actual self defense? It it does, but the people that use it need to be aware that they are in a sport, and what they're going to get from doing sports like that is they're going to get to test their gun handling and their marksmanship skills under stress. Um, but they're not going to learn good tactics, for example. So someone that's a serious defensive shooter needs to, needs to do both. They need to have, you know, the ability to shoot in the sport at the same time. They need to understand good tactics, you know, self-defense type tactics. All right. We'll talk about tactics here in a little bit. Um, but here's a thing you were on top shot history channel, yeah. top shot. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about How did that happen? Can you tell about, tell us about well, the experience yeah, there? I, and I wasn't on very long. I'm, I made, I'm, I'm, I'm famous, man. Nobody can ever claim my title. Cause I was the first person to, to ever get kicked off. Oh no. <laughs> I will. And, and, you know, it's, it is what it is. It was a, it was a really in, unique show and it was something I'm, I'm proud of, even though I got my butt kicked and I, I, I got a, you know, we all lose here and there. But the, the deal was they started recruiting people from my sport and all these other sports. And the History Channel put this show together. And basically it was it was a, the reality TV show where they put all these different shooters, you know, some of us professional shooters, some of somebody, some people that were just from the military and et cetera, in a house. And then we had to go to these different competitions. And uh, if you screwed up and, you know, we had a, the red – red team and the blue team. And if you lost, then of course you had to vote and two team members had to shoot it off. And if you lost the shoot off, you had to go home. Um, and I went into it pretty much blind. I mean, nobody had any idea what the show was all about, how to train for it, what it would be like. And it was unique because, you know, you had Hollywood people setting up a TV show and they didn't know anything really about guns or shooting. So there were a lot of little things they did that probably could have been done better, but it was a neat deal. You know, lots of people watch the show. It was a great thing for the gun culture. Yeah, they had some weird, like, Wild West type stuff, I remember. They did. Yeah, man, Wild West, some of the shows they were shooting from these ropes they were hanging off of. They, they did all kinds of unique challenges. And that's probably my dis biggest disappointment, you know, other than getting my butt beat, was that I didn't get to do all these other fun challenges. Yeah, all the other stuff. Yeah. So one thing I love about Mike, so here, some, for you who, who don't know, uh, Mike has actually, Mike lives here near Tulsa. Uh, I guess it's in Owasso, right? Kind of found right. that yep. area. Yep. Uh, anyways, uh, Mike has helped me out on content with about firearms on the website. So if you Google or search on the site, how to fire handgun, how to fire shotgun, how to fire rifle, uh, you're going to see Mike uh, looking all scary with his bald head and goatee. <laughs> <laughs> no, but one thing I love about Mike is that he makes firearms extremely approachable for the average guy. Um, and so with that in mind, I mean, for the, someone, so the guys listening who, who might want to get into firearms, right, for whatever reason, whether it's just for a hobby, because let's admit it, shooting guns is just fun. Making things go boom is fun. Yeah. Or for personal defense, uh, what's the best way to get started? Do you sign up for a class? Do you just go to the range? What do you do? Yeah, you know, man, and obviously I'll certainly toot my own horn. I, I have classes that I sell and I have online programs. We can talk about that later. But, you know, the thing that I tell everybody is – you know, first of all, you need to basically get rid of the fear and say, you know, I'm not going to be afraid of this anymore. And here's the deal. Guys, you, we are the worst because we're afraid of doing anything that's unknown, especially when we're talking about something in the, in the manly gun culture. It's like, wait, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to hold a gun or shoot a gun. I don't want to admit that to my family or friends or, you know, other people out there. Well, the reality is, you know, if you go, if you go to any range and find any good instructor and – 
uh, or any kind of program, especially competitive programs, people are the nicest people you'll ever ever meet. So I would tell the, the listeners, just jump into it. You know, go to a local gun range or contact me. I'll help you find one. And, uh, you know, get into it. And then from there, you know, don't rush it. You know, go to the gun stores that, you know, rent handguns, rent a handgun, rent a rifle, rent a shotgun. You know, read your articles, Brett. I mean, all the basics are there. And then once you're ready to take it to the next level, then you could consider, you know, buying some books or videos. There's lots of good ones out there. Taking an online course or actually taking, you know, maybe a four-hour or one-day course. I don't recommend the new people take like the two-day course or three-day course because that's very intensive and it's it's hard on your body. So shoot a little bit first, get comfortable, you know, and then and then jump into it. And then if you want to try the competitive sports, watch out because once you try them, you know, you're going to be hooked. They're just they're so much fun. Well, well, speaking of like firearms instructors, like what should you look for in a good instructor? Because there's lots of them out there. There's really there's no. Um, accreditation, right? I mean, that, that, that has its vices and virtues, right? There's yeah, the pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, so with that in mind, what, what should you look for an instructor? Well, first, you're right. It does have its vices, number one. And the problem is, especially since the, uh, the global war on terrorism is winding down, however you want to put that, there are lots and lots and lots of guys and gals out there that are now instructors and instructing. And so I would tell people a few things. Number one, now, the NRA does certify instructors, and there are some certification programs in the federal and state local law enforcement entities. Um, just because someone has a instructor certification doesn't mean a lot to me. But here's what I would tell people. Number one, look for someone that has a really good base of knowledge, meaning you know, if you're going to go take a class from someone – uh, the first thing you should be able to do is, you know, go meet them and watch them shoot and or see videos of them shooting and or know of their shooting background. Because to, to really be a good instructor, you have, have to have a body of knowledge because I would want students to go to someone that has a, a very deep body of knowledge versus just a certification. And then, of course, the second thing is a certification helps because if someone is a certified instructor, at least they understand the format of instruction, you know, and I, I wrote a book uh, last year called "The Art of Instruction," and that's what it teaches people. It doesn't teach people specific text techniques that I want them to teach. It embodies, you know, the energy and the structure of instruction. Because, you know, as you know, Brett, if someone is a good instructor and they have the ability to teach something, the the student's job is simply to enjoy the process and learn. If the instructor is a bad instructor, or God forbid, teaches bad techniques, then it'll it, it's very hard to erase that memory or that bad experience for the student. You know, so that, that's my recommendation. Now, I'll, I'll give you one last thing: if you ever go to an instructor that won't shoot in front of you or that won't do things, whatever they're instructing, if they're a piano instructor, they better play the piano in front of you. If they don't do it in front of you, then they're not very good. Find someone else. <laughs> All right. What about guys who are about to, who want to buy their first firearm? Uh, Man, any advice on that? Is it something yeah. you should just rent stuff and like well, find what you like? I and mean, what should we be looking for? I will tell you this, dude. If you and if you haven't seen this, you might like this too. There, I just did a YouTube video on a trip to the gun store. Where literally, I paid uh, paid a, uh, my videographer to go to the gun store with me, and I videoed the whole thing. And I talk about how you would select a handgun and selecting a family of guns, because and here's the deal. I, I go to so many classes where people show up and they have the wrong gear and the wrong gun for them. It just doesn't work for them. So one of the biggest tips I give on that video, which is on my YouTube page, is rent them. Exactly. You're, you're, you hit it spot on. Because once you rent a gun, you know what it feels like to fire it. The second thing is, once you've rented it, get some instruction before you buy that handgun. Because just because it feels good to you doesn't mean it is good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. As a new new shooter, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you're, you know, you innocently lack the knowledge to really select the proper handgun and gear initially. So go rent a few guns, get some instruction, shoot the instructor's guns. Most instructors have a dozen different handguns that they've, you know, they've bought over the years. Um, you know, but like I said, the video that I did is is kind of the because everybody told me, Mike, your books and your videos are great, but you don't have anything that's very basic. Like, I'm brand new to this. What do I do the second I walk in the gun store? And I, I teach that in the video. Yeah, I mean, the thing I found um, is that you can get really, you can spend a lot of money. Oh, man. Like, wasted money, too, uh, trying to figure out that if you had just taken the time to try stuff yeah. before you actually buy. Yeah. So. And the thing about that is once you've bought, it's, it's uh, you know, all guns retain their value, but they're not going to retain the same value. So 
it just, it, I, like I said, I did the video because of, I've had so many students that show up that, that, are, that have been so misinformed in their gun purchase or their gear purchase trip to the store. I mean, it's, it's really pitiful. So Yeah. So, uh, all right. So you, you buy your gun, um, you know, you want to own that, but you want to be a responsible gun owner. So what should a, a, f- a typical firearms regimen look like if you want to be really serious and really adept at using your firearm? Okay. Well, for man, before I answer that, let's separate in the, into the two different arenas. Number one, if you're going to be, if you're training for defensive reasons or self-defense, that's a completely different context than training for competition. Okay. So, if I were to say, and more, more likely, most of your listeners, they're probably going to want to be, they're going to, they're going to want to use a firearm for self-defense, maybe home defense, vehicle defense, whatever. So. You know, the bottom line there to approach that in a serious nature is to learn how to build the skills with drills, and the drills have to be built properly. So, for example, most of my skill, Brett, and most of the professional shooters I know spend a large amount of time dry firing and manipulating their firearms at home in a safe. You know, there's some safety rules you have to follow, but basically handling the firearm, learning how to draw it, learning how to reload it, learning how to clear malfunctions, and those those skills can all be practiced and taught in dry fire. You don't have to go to the range at all. You can, use, matter of fact, in my online course, all of the first drills are dry fire drills. Like, like the first fifteen of them, you never have to leave your house. You can do it in a safe area uh, in your home and and develop a tremendous amount of skill without you know firing a live round. Of course, the next step is to find a good range and go to the range. And whether you're getting instruction from videos or a person is to start to put those aspects into use when you're actually firing that, that you know, the rifle hang on or shotgun yourself. Okay, so it's dry fire every day, something you should probably do, be doing? Man, almost every single day. You know, it's like fitness. You know, if you, if you don't stick to it and do it, you know, routinely four or five times a week, you're not going to get anything out of it. But, you know, three days a week dry fire for 10 to 15 minutes will develop skills that are really unbelievable to most people, you know. Yeah, and then try to get to the range, what, once a week? Once a week, man. Yeah, if you get the reins once a week, once a week you're golden. I know people that once they develop the initial skill, will maintain their skill every other week, maybe once a month for like half a day, you know, for a longer range session. You know, but once a week is really good. If you're dry firing three or four days and going to the live fire range once a week, I mean, you're going to develop some serious skills. And what about competition? Is that something you'd have to get a little more serious about and spend more time with? Well, you do, but here's the thing. I'll tell everybody out there, don't wait until you think you're uh, at, at a certain level to shoot your first match. It's much better just to show up and get into it. Now, I'm not saying they have to go to a match and shoot the first one they ever see. Go and watch one initially if you're new to this stuff, but don't be that person that waits for one or two or three years until you think you have a certain level of skill to go to the match because what you're going to realize is once you get to the match itself, you missed all of that fun and all of, all of that experience along the way. And, and secondly... Um, you probably don't have the skills necessary to be able to participate in the sport. So, and I know it sounds weird. My recommendation is to get a basic level of skill, go watch a match, and, and if it's like, man, this looks really fun, jump into it. And you're going to have a half a dozen people there that will help you out and give you gear, or loan you gear, you know, and th- because people generally in our sports are very friendly. So we've talked a lot about like sort of beginner um, firearm you know, for people who want to get started. But what about uh, people who are seasoned firearm practitioners? Are there are there mistakes that you commonly see that they make or things that they're overlooking in their own self-defense training or competition training? Yeah, man. They um, Here's the deal. I don't – and I don't say this to, to insult anybody, but most most of us are taught – if we if we're a shooter, we were taught to shoot – probably by a parent, probably by our father, okay? And uh, some of us are taught really well. Some of us were not taught that well. And, you know, one of the comments and emails I get all of the time is that when people get on some of the free stuff that I give out, the articles on my blog or the videos or whatever, and they try some of the, you know, the techniques. Let's talk, you know, for example, handgun shooting, how to properly grip a handgun and how to manage the trigger better so you can shoot it faster and more accurately because I think there's always a balance that, that needs to be met. People just, this light bulb goes off and they realize how wrong they've been taught along the way. Most most people that come to my classes uh, don't know how to grip a handgun properly. Uh, they fail to understand how to manage the trigger properly. And what I'm, you know, Brett, what I'm talking about is to shoot it fast and accurately. And understand fast and accurately 
that's applicable in both the self-defense arena and the competitive arena. It's the same skill sets. We don't need to separate those. Um, you know, and then from the self-defense you know perspective, there's boy, there's a lot of information out there. Especially if you start to get on and and follow some of these videos that that are wrong, where you're just watching some cracker jack do whatever. I mean, you know, unfortunately, people learn wrong, and that's most of the, my classes. I spend a large majority of the time fixing problems that were ingrained. You know, habits, yeah. bad habits. All right, so let's talk about you mentioned tactics. Right, is an important yeah. part of self defense. So. I was gonna. The thing. What was I? Where was I going with this? Well, I'm gonna have to have the guy, my my editor, edit this out. Um, okay, so yeah, listen. Just the as far as tactics go, a lot of you see a lot of in the tactical world. Everyone's like obsessed with the gun, right? It's like my gun. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if I got a problem, well, I'll just shoot the guy. I mean, it's it's sort of like a joke. Um, on our site, amongst me and my my fellow writers, that whenever you publish like a. Uh, an article on hand-to-hand -hand combatives like Krav Maga or something like that, there's always going to be some guy who's going to say, well, I'll just shoot him with my gun. I know, dude. All the time. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, let's, let's talk about tactics. So what role does a firearm play in self-defense? Well, here's the deal. First of all, you, know, I, you what you just said was so incredibly true. And uh, the problem with that is the problem with people saying, well, I'll just shoot them is number one, uh, you may not be able to because you might not be able to get your gun out. And what we do is I do what's called um, – we do a lot of uh, MMA type combative stuff here. But I do it with some guys that are also armed with blue guns and training knives. So we're, we're using safe plastic firearms or little – you know, what's called cert firearms – and training knives. And what we do is we just arm ourselves like we'd normally be armed and everything is in play. Strikes, kicks, knees, wrestling. And then we work on how we would get to the gun or get to the knife or, you know, draw the handgun, etc. And I'll tell you, man, I'm pretty good at drawing a handgun. I've been doing it professionally for about 20 years now. And I cannot get a handgun out more often than not against a motivated attacker that's punching me in the face. So, when you, when you say that, you're exactly right. People need to have a self-defense uh, continuum, for lack of a better word. They need to understand uh, distance. They need to understand how to use their hands and their feet uh, for both striking as well as movement offline or maybe sprint movement where they're literally sprinting and putting a vehicle or something between them and the attacker. And when we're talking about you know self-defense, it's not just one part. It's not like, okay, I've got a handgun. I've got a care permit. Now I'm able to defend myself. No, no, no. It goes way beyond that. You understand? And that's the first thing I try to get across in most of my classes. And yeah, I mean that that whole distance thing is because I've done that. Sim I've done a similar drill like that where you had a guy with a knife. Um, you ha I had my fire, you know, a blue gun, you yep. know, in my in holstered, not even hold. It was like where I can you know conceal carry, and he attacked me, and I could never get a. a shot off and I got stabbed multiple times and That's died right. multiple yeah. times. It was really humbling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, so an important part of, of tactics in self-defense is being situationally aware. And you talk a lot about this and you, you taught, you taught me this really kind of cool game to improve your situational awareness. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I'm thinking we were talking about the, uh, the, the, where we were doing the identification and later on you kind of test your buddy or test whoever you're with to see what they saw. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and basically I turn it in, into a game. And I'll actually – I play this with my nine-year-old son, believe it or not. So we'll be in a weird area and um, I will spot someone that maybe looks like they're out of place or whatever. And then later on I'll just – whoever I'm with, say, hey, what would you see in the store? Who would you see in the store that was out of place? or that You know, and the bottom line is what, what I try to do is get them to recall information. So to really develop – uh, aware, what we call awareness because of awareness is the first step in avoidance. Everybody always says, I'm going to avoid the fight. I'm going to, I'm going to avoid avoid. Well, you can't avoid unless you're aware first. And that's the first thing is turning your, your senses back on because we're so dumbed down in, in the world. You know, our, our heads are stuck in our cell phones. You know, we're thinking about other things. We, we don't, we, we're just not aware of our surroundings where if I dropped, you know, all of your listeners off right now uh, in Kodiak, Alaska, on a river, and the salmon are probably running sometime soon, and they knew there were Kodiak grizzly bears around, the first thing they would do uh, would be turn up their awareness level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but we're not, we don't do that in society. So the awareness game is very simple. You just play it with your you know, spouse or friend or children or whoever else. And say, hey, what would you see? Inside Walmart, there were two guys 
that were weird. Did you see them? If you, if they, if you, if you did, what were they wearing? What were they doing? And, and whoever catches those little details of information wins the game. You know? So you start keeping track of points. And for kids, it becomes a game. And then the neat thing is you can ask them, well, do you think that person was a bad guy or a bad woman? You know, bad? And they'll say, well, yeah, I think so. And then you can ask, them, well, who, who was in this store that could help you? And they'll be like, well, there was a mother with two children because a mother with two children is probably pretty safe. Or there was a police officer or a security guard in a gray uniform. And that's, you know, that's how I make it into a game. So, yeah, that, I guess that whole point of the situation, you, you talked about avoiding the fight. And that's something I think a, a mentality – when things – when you bring out your gun, right, like that's – that's not a good day. Right. Um, that's a horrible day. It's a yeah. horrible day. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess I'll, what, I've, what I've noticed in firearms training uh, that I've taken is that the, when, as far as tactics go, a lot of emphasis placed on how to not get in that position in the first place. And I guess situational awareness plays a big role in that. Well, yeah, man. I mean, if you think about this, all of these millions of concealed carry holders are doing the right thing. They're, they, I'm hoping they're getting some training. They're carrying their firearms, et cetera, et cetera. But even on the best day, if they had to defend their lives and they, they had to shoot somebody, they are gonna, it's, they're going to spend almost everything they have in their bank accounts unless they're super rich to defend the right decision. And I applaud them for that. But if they could have just avoided that problem, if they could have avoided that fight altogether, they're going to be so much better off. You know, and like you said, you know, a lot of people are like, I'll just shoot them. It's not that easy. It doesn't work that way. And more importantly, if you do, it's going to be a miserable, miserable experience. It's one that I recommend that you avoid entirely. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just a bad situation. So, you know, turn on that awareness and, uh, you know, be a humble, polite individual. You know, have the ability to defend your life if you need to. But, man, stay away from it if you can avoid it. Yeah. All right. So another thing I love about uh, your content, Mike, and the way your approach towards self-defense is the role physical fitness plays in that. What role does physical fitness play in your philosophy and training? Man, physical fitness is everything. And understand it, it ties in both my competitive shooting and what I do in my sport as well as self-defense. Because as you know, and you, I know you're into some of the lifting. I've been watching some of your videos and everything else, man. Fit, a a self-defense situation is more than likely oftentimes going to start out in a fight where your fitness is going to have to be really, really high. Or the, the higher it is, let's say that's the great equalizer. The higher your fitness level, the better off you are. Um, and, you know, then the bottom line is the more it increases your skill set. So, it's, you know, having good fitness is like a force multiplier. You're going to be able to defend yourself better. And I, I wrote about this not long ago. I said, you know what? As a side, if you never get in a fight, if you focus on your fitness, what I call fighting fitness, guess what? You're going to be in better shape. You're, you're going to be happier. You're going to feel better. And you're going to live longer because you're more likely to die from heart disease than you are probably from a gunfight. Yeah, and one thing I think it's what's great about what's good about physical fitness for self defense. Not only is it useful in a fight, but it's great for avoiding fights in the first place because it acts as a deterrent, right? Absolutely. If if you look strong and in shape, you know. Here's the thing: most criminals they're criminals of opportunity. They're yep. only going to go after people they think they can beat because they look out of shape. They're fat. They're small and skinny or whatever. And that's why most people, most attackers, attack women. That's right. Um, so if you look big and strong, you're probably not going to get messed with all that often. Yeah, you know, and another thing about that, man, when I started training and doing combatives and I've been doing martial arts for years, I find that the more in shape I am and the better trained I am, my confidence level goes up to the point where people can read and they can feel that. And, and more importantly, that internal confidence level, you know, it's like I don't if, – if, if a guy tries to pick a fight with me, I am completely comfortable walking away. He can call me a coward. He can call me a scary cat. That's fine. I have no interest in fighting. Now, if I do have to fight, I know what my abilities are. But it, it gives you a confidence that allows you just to relax and walk away from things. And like you said, you're right. That, that appearance is, is a very, very big deterrent to criminals. You know, they prey on the weak. So what does your fitness regimen look like? Is it lifting and cardio, high-intense cardio? Man, almost everything I'm doing now it has some sort of function. So, for example, my cardio is not cardio. It's a circuit where I'm doing some sort of intervals and I'm doing a set of strikes on my bag, elbows, hands, knees, legs, whatever. And then I'll work into weapon strikes, believe it or not, where I'm working some of my close-range techniques. Where I, you know, These are hard to describe on audio, but video is better. And then I'll go right into something like kettlebell swings or some sort of functional fitness type exercise. That's my cardio routine. I normally do 
you know, one minute up, one minute down. Sometimes I vary that. I really push the intensity on the up interval, and then I try to bring my heart rate back down. And sometimes I'll go longer, you know, two, two to three minutes because that, that's what you're going to do in a fight. You're going to expend a whole bunch of energy, and then you're going to try to rest. And, that, and that's what I want to try to mimic. My lifting stuff, and I don't know if you know this or not, Brett, but I, I had both hips replaced. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. that in email. So now my lifting has changed. I mean, I'm doing all of the stuff, the strength. I'm, I'm watching your videos, dude. I'm doing deadlifts. I'm starting to squat again. Nice. And what I want to do is I want to build as much strength as I possibly can with perfect form. You know, and I want to be able to push someone off me. I want to be able to pull my body weight up. I want to be able to pick something off the ground. I want to, I really focus a lot on my grip strength uh, because grip strength is everything in a fight. So I focus, you know, really all of my fitness time is spent doing something I could functionally use on the shooting circuit or in a fight. Do you ever do like uh, exercise and then like use like a, a cert pistol or an airsoft pistol? <laughs> Yeah, in that routine, I actually do, man. So, for example, on my down set, when I'm letting my heart rate go back down, I'll use a cert. You know, a cert is made by an LTA. So I'll sit there and I'll, I'll dry fire and work on maybe a trigger control drill with two hands or trigger control with my strong hand or trigger control with my weak hand uh, or maybe my reloads. And I'm doing that during the down because, you know, I'm, I'm using my trigger finger. I'm not, I'm not using the big muscles. And then when I go back into the next set, I'm doing the next cardio set, whatever I'm trying to do you know what i'm saying so yeah, yeah i do i integrate that stuff all of the time That's and cool. it also allows me to integrate my firearm stuff when my heart rate is up so i get to experiment what it's experience what it's like when i'm when my heart rate's gonna up because your heart rate's gonna scream in a fight you know what i'm saying yeah yeah and that affects your physical performance absolutely man and so for those of you who don't aren't familiar a cert pistol is based it's a laser pistol that looks like a glock yep. exactly like a glock it's a it's a really cool it's an awesome training tool it's a phenomenal training tool, man, and I use mine all the time in my combative stuff. I mean, I'm I and the the founder Mike Hughes that developed. He probably doesn't want to hear this, but I I'm striking my bag with my pistol. You know, I mean, I'm literally doing weapon strikes with it. I, I haven't been able to break it yet. So yeah, I got one. And, uh, I keep it by on my desk, and I I've killed every single light switch in my house with it. There you go. I, it's like, I I've literally if you listen to this. Yeah, I got one in my hand right now. Pew pew pew. Yeah, literally, man. And you got to make the pew pew noise. Pew no. pew. That's right. No, you don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. Right. Del- we got to delete that. You got to eh. delete that now. Don't delete it. All right, well, Mike. Where can people find out more about your work and uh, your online training programs that you have to offer? Man, the best link to me is probably just to go on my website because my website has all of the training courses, both the physical courses, the location, the training calendar, the online training. Links to the Vimeo videos if you want to download the videos, as well as my web store. And that's shooting-performance.com. And, of, of course, the dash is a hyphen. You know, So shooting-performance.com. My blog is blog.shooting-performance.com. But there's a link to my Facebook, my blog, and all of the training stuff on the website. That's the best place to go. Awesome. And you got training on programs on Vimeo and Udemy, correct? Yeah, man. Udemy Udemy is an actual online course where I interact with the students. And uh, and on Vimeo is is just the videos. For example, a lot of people want to download the videos and take them to the range. And that's why I did the Vimeo videos. Um, But Udemy is a little more interactive. It's something where if you're a new person to shooting, you know, I'd recommend you do the online because you can do it at your own pace. You can do it from your home. You can share it with your husband or your wife or your boyfriend. You know, so that's the one I'd recommend. Very cool. Well, Mike Sieklander, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a bunch, man. Take care. Our guest today was Mike Sieklander. You can find out more about his work at shooting-performance.com. Also check out the American Warrior Society. And if you're looking at some of Mike's books on competitive and defensive handgun training, just search for Mike Sieklander on amazon.com. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you enjoy this podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you'd give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast, help get the word out about the podcast and give us feedback that we can use to improve the podcast. said podcast a lot there. Uh, Anyways, until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly.